I already don't like this church already. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you why. Ain't no big black man supposed to be in the back crying. <laughs> <laughs> that thing messed me up, man. I was all right. Wasn't that a beautiful testimony? Yeah. Oh man, I'm in the ooh, ooh, ooh. My wife's like, get it together. You <laughs> I'm someone that's struggling, boy. Cause you know, I got I got I got two girls, you know, Harmony and Kenzie, they five and four years old. And so that that hit home when you talk about because you you put your kids in that moment. And no one ever wants to go through that. So, uh, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Is anybody grateful to be here on this morning? Freedom family. Flew me into Liberty, put me in this big old hotel. <laughs> 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 Woo! Uh, yeah. Had a drive from Charlotte. They're like, mm, mm, mm. stay in Charlotte. Just stay in Charlotte. Let's drive. It's best you drive. Ain't nowhere to stay here in Liberty. I'm like, really? So, um, but it's an honor to be here. I'm happy that uh, this is this is my son's first church service. He's a month old. My wife insisted. She's like, she said, I have to be here. My wife's from London, England. She said, I have to be here to support you. And I'm like, man, let the boy rest. He just came out the womb. But she's like, I want him to come to church. So this, is, uh, so this is history right here. So his first church service was in Liberty, North Carolina. That, that he going to sleep through. He going to sleep through the whole service. You know, my wife is a trooper. You know, I said, my wife, she a, she a, she a true thug. She a gangster. I'm telling you. I ain't lying. Anybody ever delivered a baby naturally is a true gangster. I don't care if you're black, white, no matter. You're just gangster. You're inducted into somebody's gang. Because I learned a lot about my wife, you know, because, you know, we didn't have this. This is the third baby. So the first two, she said, you know, she said, you know, honey, I'm going to deliver it naturally. You know, she always had this plan to deliver the baby naturally. But when she got an eight centimeters, she's like, oh, I need the epidural. <laughs> It got real, you know? <laughs> you know, all those goals and stuff, watching them YouTube videos, they didn't know. It's the real thing when you're in that room. And so uh, my wife said, um, she said, you know, for the third one, she was like, you know, honey, I'm, I'm going to go after it again. I said, what, after the epidural? <laughs> she, she said, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do it naturally. I'm not going to give up this time. I'm like, all right, play it. OK. Um. <laughs> we going to see how you hold out. And I'm being a supporter husband, because you're never supposed to tell your wife no. You know, he go like, oh, baby, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm here, like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, I know she's going to give up. Seven centimeters going in, you know. The thing is, we kept on getting these false alarms, you know, false alarms, false alarms. So he went to the hospital, and they were like, mm, she only two centimeters going home. She said, oh, honey, I can't believe this, you know. They go home, and uh, another false alarm, like two days later, she had contractions every two minutes. Boom, we on this showtime. I'm speeding down the house. It's the best time to speed, you know. You get <laughs> Woo, I was going like 85. I'm, I was, I, oh, it felt so good. It felt so good. I really go 95, but I ain't want to say 95. Like, it's dangerous now. I was going 90. But uh, it was the best moment just, just to hit it down the road. And if the police pulled me over, I was like, hey, follow me to the hospital, player. You know, follow me over to the hospital, bro. We, uh, we got there, and they was like, go on, go on back home. You know, she just two and a half centimeters. I was like, what in the world is going on with you and this baby? So, um, and, 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 you know, anybody in the medical profession, you know, they shouldn't give you too much hope like this. They said, you know, you're going to have a baby with, by the weekend. Man, the weekend come, the week done went by now. I said, come on, doctor. <laughs> so we just waiting and waiting. And finally, my wife, she just gave up. She's like, forget it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm tired. I'm just, boom. And I like, that's so cool about God. Like, when you just, like, let it out of your hands, you're like, let me handle this thing. So she tired, so they was like, they're gonna induce her. So they're gonna induce her. She was a little nervous about that. So uh, they said, we're gonna do the uh, induction. Is that said that right? Induction. Sound like something about to happen, induction, like a ceremony. <laughs> it just didn't sound right coming out of my mouth. If it was in my brain, induction, like, no, 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 don't sound like the right word. <laughs> but it sounded like I was supposed to say it, but. So they was doing the induction ceremony. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was scheduled for Sunday, scheduled for Sunday, and uh, we were ra just waiting, just waiting, just waiting, and Saturday morning comes around, and my baby boy did not want to be induced. He was like, I'm going to go ahead and come on out. So he started knocking at the door. <laughs> and my wife's like, four in the morning, she's like, oh, oh my goodness, 
I feel like, I'm feeling pain. I said, okay, all right, all right. it's four o'clock in the morning. Is this real? God, I, can go, I can go back to sleep, you know. It's, it's four in the morning. She says, no, honey, uh, it's funny. I'm, I'm, it's because the constructions are getting so much stronger. I said, all right, let me know now, let me know. So I pull out the phone. I got a little app. And you can time it. You get a little contraction. I'm just timing that thing. I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh, you're looking good. I feel like I'm doing something. I said, how many... <laughs> How many minutes apart? He said, he said it's, it's precious. Two minutes. Like, oh, we looking, I mean, we looking good. So uh, our plan was to labor as much as possible at the house. Because we didn't want to get sent home this time. And we didn't want to be in the hospital for a long time, have no 20-hour labor. So she said, honey, go ahead. Go ahead and run the water. She says, she goes in the bathtub, and she runs the water, and she just, Hoo. I said, uh-oh. And when she said, Hoo, I said, something, something coming. I don't know what it is. But something on the way. I said, I ain't never heard this before. And then so we just waiting, waiting, waiting. And typically, you usually call the hospital to say, is it OK to come? No, I called the hospital and said, we on the way. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and that's what got me about my wife. Like, she could still be in her right mind, like after the contractions and having regular conversations. But in the contraction, she just turned into a whole other person. She said, honey, if we have to go to oh! I said, what in the world? She said, it's coming. I said, what? I said, who? She said, more contractions. And then went away and she kept on, okay, we're going to go to the hospital. I'm like, baby, you just can't flip the switch like that. We ain't doing Transformers today, baby. And so the whole way to the hospital was regular conversations and out of nowhere, ah! like, I ain't never seen this out of my wife before in my life. We get to the hospital and they, they go ahead and check her out. We get to the hospital about 9.15. At 9.15, they checked my wife, and they said, oh, she's six and a half centimeters. I said, oh, it's showtime. <laughs> we go to the room, check her out. It's 9.30. Y'all, she's seven centimeters. I said, this baby is ready. So they, they check her out. They lay her on the bed, and she doesn't really want to lay on, lay on the bed. She wants to labor standing up as much as possible. She says, on, she says laying on her back is just uncomfortable for her. So she's just laying on the side of on the side of. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? And, she, and, and this is how I know she's different, because she just finished nursing school. So all the so she meets a lady who was helping her during the nursing process. The lady, she's teaching a class, and she has nursing students at the hospital. My wife said, have them all come into the room. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> so we have a crowd of witnesses. <laughs> Front row watching this whole thing. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm like, I said, we're going to get these jokers a show tonight. So we just having fun, and then my wife is pushing, is pushing, and, just, and she just labored as much as possible. The delivery team hadn't gotten to the room yet because it wasn't time. She won 10 centimeters. They check her out, they, but her water still hadn't, hadn't, hadn't broke yet. So I lay on the back, I break my wife's water, and uh, she was like, all right, showtime. I said, you gonna be good? I said, you, you don't got no epidural. She said, honey, I'm gonna make it. I said, all right, we, we almost did. Don't give in. She said, honey, just, uh, she said, but doctor, can I have something to, to take the edge off? They said, the only thing that can take the edge off is you having this baby. <laughs> she said, okay. They said, but, 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 but listen, one thing they told my wife, they said, the baby is not shifted in the right position right now. You're going to have to move around and do something so the baby can drop so we can start pushing. So my wife still doesn't want to lay on the back. Still, she doesn't want to stand up. She wants to go on all fours. She goes on all fours on the bed, hugging the back of the bed. I ain't never seen this before. <laughs> and, and, and she got the gown on, and the gown kind of opened up. And like, hey, 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 close that gown up. We ain't had this baby yet, you know. You know. I had to close that gown up. I don't mean no harm. <laughs> you know, I don't mean no harm. They told me six weeks. <laughs> I'm being honest. That's the only thing I can... I'm just being honest up here. So she's holding, she's holding the bed. True story. Holding the bed. And she says, oh, she's eight centimeters. So we got, we got, we got two centimeters to go, y'all. So, so I just know we got good enough 45 minutes till the baby come. True story. Y'all think I'm a little lying telling y'all joke. She says, oh, I feel pressure. I said, pressure? She says, it's in my butt. <laughs> just like that. So I'm standing beside the bed. I, I, I look back there. When I look, the midwife the whole time, no gloves on, the delivery team's not in yet because it's not time. She's just massaging my wife's back, the lower part of the back. When I look back there, his head is looking at me. I 
I said, oh my God, that's my baby. <laughs> that's his head. And she couldn't, the midwife couldn't put her gloves on fast enough. She said, go ahead and get him. So I reached my hands under his head and she pushed and he fell out in my hands. Ow! She said, you delivered your baby. And I said, right then, <laughs> I'm a certified doctor. Hello, somebody. <laughs> I'll be doing appointments in the back if anybody need any checkups. I'm a full-fledged doctor up in this bad boy. But I gotta give it to my wife, man. You know, I, I found out that day that my wife was a true thug. But four years ago, five years ago, really, I found that my wife is not just from London, England. See, I've been learning stuff about these pregnancies, about my wife. Stuff be coming out. See, see, my wife born in London, England, she talked to the British accent just like this. And, and she black. I ain't know they made black people over there. I ain't know. <laughs> I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. I don't know nothing. <laughs> and so when I met her, she had this, this British accent, and it, it just messed me up. I'm like, I didn't know. I, woo, what? You got an accent that ain't country? I didn't know. It's from another country? Wow. So she talked with this accent just like this, and she, when we got married, she took me over to London, England. She said, honey, that's Parliament right there. That's Big Ben right there. That's Buckingham Palace. That's where the Queen stays at. Yeah, y'all, man, I'm telling you, man, she messed me all the way up. She says, honey, you know, I know you like fried chicken wings and collard greens and macaroni and cheese, but, but let me introduce you to shepherd's pie and bangers and mash and fish and chips, yeah? Y'all, she filled my belly, y'all. That's how she got me. <laughs> And so she got me caught up in the UK, got me caught up in the accent, got me caught up in the, the European way of doing things. It was just totally different, man. It, it messed me all the way up. And I failed to do all my research, though. Because nine times out of ten, a black person living in London, England, is not from London, England. They came from somewhere. Her folks are from a place called West Africa. So her mama's from Ghana, her daddy is from Nigeria. And I didn't know that, and, I, and I, I, I'm nervous about the ladies. Where you come from will come out when you get upset. I'm telling you. Some of y'all right now, y'all work in Greensboro, North Carolina, somewhere, but the liberty will come out of you. Yes, it will. When somebody gets you upset, oh, I didn't know she was from Liberty. Oh, Lord. It will come out, I'm telling you. So I didn't know that was African traits in my wife, in her very strong. I ain't know until it was time to deliver our first baby. 27 hours of labor, she's pushing out, and then, you know, same thing she did with our, with our, with our son just now. She said she didn't want no epidural, but what I tell you, she gave in to the last a little bit. But she told me the whole way, she said, honey, make sure no matter what I say, no matter what I do, make sure I don't use that thing called the epidural. At the time, I didn't know what no epidural was. I said, what's the epidural? She said, it's a slung needle. They stick it in the back of your back. When they inject the fluid in the lower, the pack, lower part of your back, you can't feel any of your lower extremities, no matter what I say, no matter what, what I do. Mike shut up, use that thing called the epidural. Y'all, so we looking good. First five hours, she pushing. <laughs> All natural. We get to the 24th hour, they like to say there was a shift in the atmosphere at my old church. <laughs> she looked at me and said, honey, I really can't take it longer. I really have to renege on what I said. Please call the doctor and I need the epidural. I said, baby, she said, no, 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 you can't do this. She said, honey, I can't do it. I said, listen, I said, if it get real tough, just hold my hand. Y'all, I ain't know no better. <laughs> she said, I really, I can't hold your hand. I said, listen, hold my hand. She said, I, I really can't, you're not really listening to me, Timothy. I really can't hold your hand. There's so much pressure. Now. I said, hold my hand. She said, I can't. And when she said, can't, a tear jumped out of her eye, y'all. When that tear jumped out, I didn't know that meant that Africa was on their way. <laughs> I looked at the woman, too. I said, hold my hand. She said, listen, I will kill you. <laughs> I told you several times to get the doctor. I said, who is this? Y'all, I was so confused, man. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. So I'll be learning things about my wife, man. She's shaking her head, but no, that's the truth. No. <laughs> this is all based on a true story. But I'm, I'm excited about my son. We got a biblical family. My wife is Esther. I'm Timothy. We like to keep it biblical with my family. I love how he does the names. So it was only right for the name of my son, Second Timothy. And um, <laughs> he's going to be blessed. He's going to be blessed. He's going to be blessed. And as being a father, you know, I was reminded, uh, especially like the testimony that was just given, you know, you know, just living life, especially in this Christian walk, we don't want to go through nothing. We don't. I don't want to go through, I don't want my child to go through any sickness, any disease. I, we don't want it. 
We don't want to lose our job. We don't want to face foreclosure. We don't want, we don't want, mm -mm, we don't want that. But sometimes you, you go through. And, and, and that's sometimes the biggest fear of being a husband. Because you always want to be right. You always want to be perfect. You always want to be able to pay all the bills on time. You want your kids to be healthy. You just have these anxieties in life, you know. And so uh, my, my, my fear when I got married was could I take care of my family, you know. And um, could I provide? Could I take care of them, you know. And so God just continues to always remind me, you know, I gave you a great example. And, um, and he said, your father was one of the best examples that you can pull from, man. He said, look how your father did. Let me tell you, for me, I'm a, I'm a daddy's boy. I don't know about y'all. I'm a, I love my daddy. And I'm glad he's still here. I love my daddy. I love everything about my daddy. 21 years in the military. I'm talking about, oh, man, leading the ROTC program right now. I mean, I love everything about my daddy. Except one thing. He saved too much money. <laughs> Saves too much money. My daddy got some good money, but he saved too much of it. You ever heard people say they, they can stretch a dollar? Oh, them dollars flexible in my house, y'all. I don't know how my daddy do it, but his theory, his theory is that he said, he said, son, in order to save money, you got to learn how to fix everything. I said, what you mean? He said, look at that transmission on your mama car. He said, you heard it slipping the other day, didn't you? He said, go start it up right now. It ain't slipping no more. I said, who did it? He said, hey, he said, he said, he said Chevrolet didn't do it. He said, because Chevrolet going to charge me $3,000. He said, cost me two fifty, and I put it in in three hours. He said, you see that deck in the back? He said, it was going to cost us $1,500. I put it in myself in an hour and a half. I said, Daddy, you can do a lot. He said, I sure can. That's why I save money. That's why we got money. My mama heard Daddy bragging. She said, well, Sammy, why are you talking about you can fix everything? Uh, you know I've been talking about I want some hardwood floors on this floor right here. He said, well, pull the carpet up then. They pull the carpet up, and my daddy orders the hardwood floor. The hardwood floors come in three days later. Thing is, my daddy doesn't have an electric nail gun. The electric nail gun is what you need to put the nails into the floor to keep the floor down. My daddy don't own one. So he go to his favorite place. It's called Home Depot. He go to Home Depot, and Home Depot looking out for him. You know why? Because Home Depot got a sale for electric nail guns. For four hours, he can get it for $19.99. The thing is, it's going to take my daddy a good day and a half to put these floors in. But he see that, 14, that $19.99 for four hours. He said, that sound good right there. Yeah, I got to speed up the process a little bit. Uh. And the lady heard her mumbling. She said, sir, 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 no, 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 don't rush yourself. Don't try to do it in four hours. You can get it for the whole day and bring it back the next day for $24.99. He said, but that's $5 for that guy. <laughs> he said, let me get the four hours for $19.99. I said, no, 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 no. I'm in my mind. I'm like, no, he, he don't got enough time. He said, baby boy, start the truck up and get my red knee pads. He started the, uh, start the truck up, and his knee pads was ready for him, and they the red ones, too. He ain't never tried these before, so he ready to do it all. We get to the house, and I'm already nervous, because my dad feels like when he left the store, his four-hour clock already started. He put his knee pads on, and he uses the electric nail gun for the very first time in his life. He gets it wound up, he gets it ready, the generator going, now you can hear the pressure coming. He said, here it come, baby boy. He said, give me my first slab. He laid down the first slab. He said, Pack up. He said, oh, yes, sir. Packer, packer. He said, oh, we looking good. Packer, packer. And I got to give him that he was looking good. He's, he spent on the knee pad. I said, oh, yes, sir. He pat, 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 pat. And he worked his way through the hallway. Pat, 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 pat. Worked his way through the foyer. Pat, 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 pat. And pat right through his hand. Blood goes everywhere. My mama said, well, you all right? He said, I ain't. <laughs> she gets a towel and she wraps it around his hand. Blood is filling the towel so fast. We can't even get another towel to get replaced. It just it happened so fast. She rushed him to the emergency room. We get to the emergency room. They got me sitting in the waiting room, my dad in the back for an hour and a half. And I'm nervous because I'm like, they ain't call me back. And so they finally called me back to be with my daddy. And I see my daddy doing something I ain't never, ever seen him do before in my life. And that's crying. I ain't never seen my daddy cry. Never. So when I see my daddy cry, I, I'm a daddy's boy. I start crying too. <laughs> 
I said, what's wrong, daddy? He said, he said baby boy, it ain't looking too good, baby boy. I said, what's wrong, daddy? He said, we ain't going to make it. I said, you lost that much blood? He said, we ain't going to make it to the Home Depot in four hours. I said, really, dad? That's five more dollars. Come on, dad. He said, we ain't going to make it, baby boy. True story. But I love him, though. I love everything about him. I love everything about him. And the cool thing I love about my dad is, he taught me faith, man. Faith is, is one, one of the key pillars that you need in life. Just to go through life, just to walk this walk, you got to have it. I don't care. You got to have it. They say faith is the size of a mustard seed. But sometimes, you know, I tell people, sometimes faith can get you in, in trouble. It make you, you know. Believe something that you think is too big and sometimes it don't go like you want it to. What do you do? Sometimes you feel like a failure when you believe and trust God and you leave everything. Because sometimes you look crazy out here faith walking. But I choose to believe. I choose to walk by faith and not by sight. I worked a job. Um, and this job, man, it encouraged me too because it showed me that God can take care of you. Because at 21 years of age, I worked at a place called Moses Cone Health System. Man, let me tell you something. Being a young black man, 21 years old, with Moses Cone Health System sticker on your car, <laughs> folk treat you different. I pulled in, and I got out the car, and I, and, and, and I had, a, had me a nice suit on. My, my, my jacket closed just right. My tie went all the way to the top. The crease went right down the middle of my pants. My shoes were shining so good. And I could buzz right into the ER. I walked past people and I said, boop. They said, oh, is he a doctor? I said, <laughs> y'all was feeling good. Until my walkie talkie went off and said, security, come to the front. And, uh, <laughs> and I had to go back to the atrium and guard the gift shop. That was my job. For eight hours, I was guarding the gift shop. But they noticed, they said, you got some big, broad shoulders, young man. We're going to need you at the main ER. I said, why? They said, most stabbings and most shootings happen at this main hospital right here than here at the hospital. I said, oh, okay, well, what I got to do with, what I got to do with me? <laughs> they said, we need you because they said, they said, when people shoot and stab people, they don't know if they're dead or not. They like to come to the hospital to make sure they finished off. They said, so we need security to be at the door. I said, said y'all want me? I said, don't let these shoulders fool you. <laughs> I ain't the one. And so I just knew they was going to throw me some, 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 uh, some machetes, some guns, or something. They hand me keys and a walkie-talkie. I said, ooh, Jesus. I said, what you want me to do, lock myself up and call for help? <laughs> I said, because that's all I'm going to do. I said, I ain't the one. I said, don't let the shoulders fool you. He said, it's going to be all right. And so, man, God graced me because ain't nothing ever popped off at the hospital while I was there. And so, uh, so that really wasn't my biggest struggle there. My biggest struggle was something called... 3.35 a.m. That was my biggest struggle. Cause I worked the graveyard shift. Anybody ever worked third shift before? That's one of the toughest shifts to ever work. Because 3.35 is waiting on you. And when you get there, I'm talking about, you ever fell asleep standing up before? You just standing there, you having a casual conversation, your knees buckling, oh, Lord, did I go out for a second? So I told my supervisor, I said, hey, I just don't want to get fired. I don't want to get caught on the camera being asleep in the corner. And he said, uh, he said, I don't want it for you either. I said, because these first two weeks, they struggled. So he said, it's a struggle for most people that never work third shift. He said, so your new job around 3.30 is to patrol the entire hospital, make sure all the doors are all secure. I said, all right. He said, there's seven floors. You got this? So I checked all seven floors. I'm telling you, I knocked out my roll. I did everything. And I got down uh, to, the, to the first floor after doing all seven floors. I said, four to seven to base, four to seven to base. Four to seven, I'm feeling good. Four to seven to base. Uh, the whole entire hospital is all secure. North Elm Street <laughs> is all secure. They said, base of four to seven, base of four to seven. Did you, did you check the basement? I said, excuse me. He said, did you check the basement? I said, mm-mm, I ain't, I ain't checked the basement. And I ain't want to check the basement, and you wouldn't want to check the basement, too, because the basement is a place that none of us ever want to go. It's called the mall. <laughs> Room 007. 
Now, how the mall work was just like this. If you go down to the basement and the door closed, all you got to say is, all secure. But, but if you go down there and the door is open, you got to go and check the mall and go inside to make sure none of the bodies are tampered with. And I took the elevator down to the morgue, and, and the way it worked, I could just look down the hallway and see. So I ain't, I ain't get off the elevator quite good. And I looked down there, and, and that's when I realized Jesus played too much. Because <laughs> that door was wide open. I said, uh oh, here we go, Lord. <laughs> so I went down there, my stomach just a bubbling, and I'm a little nervous. I said, oh, here it go. I'm just, I'm so nervous, y'all. I get there. I get there, and if you've never been to the mall, it's, 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 a, it's like a cold cubicle. It's cold. Ain't no lights in this mall. And only light I had was a light from the hallway. Got a little smell, a little tinge to the nose. So I, I went inside. I went inside the mall. I went in there, and it's, it's 13 bodies in there, because that's what my, my reports say. But I had to count it for myself. So I'm in there. I'm so nervous. I went in there, and I kept my foot on that door, because that door ain't going to close while I was up in there, y'all. <laughs> I ain't trust nobody. I don't care. And so I was supposed to count the bodies. So I, I went there and I counted. I was supposed to count 13 bodies. But for whatever reason, I counted 75 bodies that night. <laughs> I was so nervous. And, 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 and I, I, started, I started easing my way out of the morgue. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous now telling y'all the story. I felt my hands still shaking on my chest while I was telling the story. I'm easing out of the morgue. I'm easing out of the morgue because I'm getting ready to get on my walk of talk and tell them that the, the morgue was all secure. But right, right, right when I was getting ready to tell the, the base that it was all secure, something came over me. This feeling of faith came over me. I mean, it was, I never felt it before in my life. And I got reminded about who I was. I'm a child of God. In the midst of a morgue. Come on, somebody. I started reading my word that week, and I started going to this church, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a, like one of them Pentecostal churches, and I started speaking in tongue a little bit. I ain't never felt that before. And I started reading my word, and everything I read in, in the Bible was illuminating in my mind. And this particular week, I was just reading about a man named Jesus and how he healed the sick and raised the dead. Y'all, I felt this was practice right here, y'all. I just, it, it's, it's the perfect scenario. It's just me and 13 bodies. I'm in that morgue, and I got, I got confidence. I got so much faith. I closed the door. I said, somebody going to get up on tonight. I said, may there be one. And nobody raised their hand. So I looked at body number 13 and said, body number 13, today is your day for breakthrough. I ain't say it that loud. I said, today. And I got close to the body, and I, I, I started using the little, the, little, the little power that I had. I said, I want to use the little tongues I had. I could speak in tongues, just a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. So I got my razor for the day of stance, and, 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 I, and I got close to the body. I said, I said, da 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 I wish I could find them right now. They put that thing behind my back. I ain't even see it. And over the top of my ear, all I heard was, Psst. I said, the devil is a lie. I said, the devil is a lie. I said, somebody here passing notes, Jesus. I said, I can't do this no more, Lord. I was so scared, and I was getting ready to grab my walkie talk and say, I quit. I ain't lying. I promise you I was. I was about to, I was about to leave out there that day. And right when I was about to grab my walkie-talkie, my, uh, my, my walkie went off. It said, it said, stat, 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 stat. Them two, there's two words you don't want to hear in the hospital. You don't want to hear no cold blue, and you don't want to hear no stat call. And so they said, they said stat, unit 4,000. I said, oh, my God. At the time, it was a rehabilitation unit. I said, why have you got to do a stat call at a rehabilitation unit? I'm in the basement with these people that didn't get up like I thought they were. And so I just left. I closed the door and I ran there. And you got to take the stairs because you can't take the elevator when it's a stack car. So I had to take it all the way up to the fourth floor. I'm tired. Shirt coming out my pants. They said, where you been? I said, you do not want to know. I said, I was trying to be like Jesus and it didn't go too well. And I said, but you got to tell me something. They said, what's up? They was like, I said, why y'all outside the room? I said, why, why is nobody in there with the patient? 
Like all the doctors and the nurses and the security guards was outside the room like they was having a meeting. I said, what, what y'all meeting about? They was like, well, what's the doctor, the doctor came out. He said, he said, he said, oh my goodness. He said, I have never seen a patient like this before. I said, what you mean? He said, she's combative, she's spitting, barking, and biting at everybody. I said, you giving any medication? He said, I'm giving a penicillin, codeine, morphine, everything you can think of. She's rejecting all medication. I said, dog, she can't be that bad. He said, take a look for yourself. I look at her and look in the room and she just ah, 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 ah. I said, close it though. He said, I ain't told you. I said, I ain't never seen no patient act like that. He said, he said, I'm confused too. I've been working here for 25 years. I've never seen this. I said, she bitten, biting, she 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 spitting, and she yelling and growling. I said, you know what? Can I get another look at that lady? He says, Are you sure? I said, I think I know. I said, hold on. Let me get one more look at this lady, y'all. Because I was on my, I still on my high from downstairs. I felt it on me still. I said, let me get one more look. And she said, ah! I said, close it. He said, what is that? I said, I know what that is. He said, what is it? He said, I said, according to my grandma and also my Bible, and my grandma from the country, I said, Doc, that's a devil on the inside of that lady. He said, I, I said, Doc, she's demon possessed. He said, demon possessed. He said, well, what do you do with a demon? I said, I'm glad you asked. I said, my grandma said, anytime you see the devil, all you got to say is, in the name of Jesus, every devil in hell has to flee. That's what grandma told me. He said, well, who's going to say Jesus? I said, watch me as I follow Christ. True story, y'all. I went back into that room, y'all. All the doctors looking over my shoulder saying, what is it going to do? 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 I walked closer to the bed, and I could tell it was on me this time because the lady never looked my way this time. She knew I knew. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, sir. He's trying to show up for the Lord right here. I got close to the bed. She still would never look my way. I could hear this growling underneath her breath, but she was looking at the one or the other way. I'm sitting, I'm standing on this side of her. So I get close to the bed and I, and I, I nudge the bed and she still didn't move. I hit it two times. And right then, she looked over and when she, lo I, said, I said, in my mind, I said, when she locked eyes on me, I'm going to say, in the name of Jesus. And I was going to watch God work. But I got close to her and she looked around. She turned around. She looked at me and she said, Jesus. I said, oh, that's the word I was going to use. <laughs> I said, that's another type of devil right there. Is that loose from the flesh? I said, I quit. I quit this job. And I quit. And I went right to win this, y'all. True story. I tell these stories. Because they're true. Me and Pastor was talking in the back, and I said, man, I don't know jokes. I just know true stories. Name my life. And sometimes jokes and stories are funny, but sometimes you go through life. In my life, you go through stuff that's called when the jokes stop, and you got to face life. When you go through some heartaches and tough times, that's why joy is one of the best things to have in your, your back pocket because you need it. You never know when you're going to go through some tough times in your life. and Joy is the only thing that can sometimes get you through. Joy has kept me from some of the darkest times of my life. Joy is that little bit of light that I saw when I thought all hope was gone. My little buddy over there that's on my wife's shoulder, it was that little light during our darkest times. When the doctors say one thing and a light comes out of nowhere in the darkest times. When you're in college playing at North Carolina a and State University, you're on football scholarship, your rookie of the year, your freshman year, going into your sophomore year, then you get an injury, then you you get depressed. You go from a 3.1 GPA, then you go down to a 1.4 GPA. And then you lose your scholarship. And you gotta go home. That, that wasn't the darkest time in my life. The darkest time in my life was knowing that my best friend was dealing with the same exact thing. At another school, just right down the road, 
University of Virginia. Starting fullback, 6'1", 235 pounds. In the 10th grade, he could power queen 315 pounds. Amazing athlete. Dealt with the same thing. Sophomore year, academic probation. Going to his junior year, lost his scholarship. Same thing. And it was, it, was, it was tough for me because I saw him going through, but I wasn't willing to reach my hand to help. So we had the opportunity of a few months or a couple of years later, I finally regained my scholarship. But my buddy still struggled because he never could find his identity outside of football. He never got a scholarship back. In my darkest time, I found a man named Jesus Christ. In his darkest time, he found drugs and alcohol. That's how he coped with his pain. I decided to cope with mine by just showing up to this church on a Thursday for Bible study, not knowing why I was there. I just kept on going for whatever reason. He kept on going to the places that he chose to go. So we joke about all the stories about being a security guard and all that. But it was one day going into work, to that third shift. My buddy called me and said, hey man, uh, you see in the paper, man, that Kevin's missing. I said, Kevin's missing? I said, yeah, Kevin's missing. I'm like, man, what in the world? I, 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 oh, oh. Keep me posted. Well, two days later, I get another call. And they say, hey, man, they, uh, well, we, we, we found Kevin. I said, all right, what was he at? Come on, like, what was he? I said, no, 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 no. Stop. So what you mean? I said, no, we, we found Kevin. So what are you trying to tell me? They said, we found Kevin in the woods with a single gunshot wound to the head. I said, not, not 6'1", 245-pound runner, 4'5", Kevin. He was like, yeah. I said, not my best friend who, the reason why I got a full scholarship was because of him, Kevin. It's like, yeah, that Kevin. I said, a man that strong felt that weak. But the, the hardest thing about it wasn't that I lost my friend. It was that I had an opportunity to share Christ with my friend, to talk about the light that changed my life to my friend. And I didn't. I didn't because I was, I was too scared of what other people was going to think about me. But changing the subject in that room with those guys just to talk about a guy named Jesus. And so at that very moment, at his funeral, I had to stand there and look in his mother's eyes. And I realized right then that it really could have been me. This really could be Kevin right here talking and my body back there. And God gave me a, a chance to have some joy in my darkest time. See, joy comes in many different ways, my friends. Sometimes it comes while you're in your room, while you're in conversation, but you got to remember that sometimes we're the ones that may only be the ones to carry that joy. That's going to be able to show it to others. We're the light that somebody needs. Sometimes it's just not going to come while you're walking through the store. And this is how that idea probably came to you. Sometimes we're the one that's going to carry that light. And so in that moment, I realized then, I said, I will live the rest of my life, not just the one to hold the light, but also to give the light. I promise that I, I'll be bold in whatever I do, because he's just that good. Amen? Amen. Did you smile today? Amen. Did you laugh from the belly? Yeah. 
when Jennifer and Jessica and I were praying last night, that was my heart's cry, that from your belly it would just rise up. I don't know about you, but I needed that today. I don't use that word need like a lot of people. A lot of people say, I need McNuggets, or I need this, I need, no, but we do need joy. And so do me a favor, will you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me real quick? With every head bowed, every eye closed, if this is your first time here, the reason why I'm asking you to bow your heads and close your eyes is because you've been given a treasure today. You've been given a word today from God. And the reason why we ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes is we want you to be able to think about it, to ponder it without being distracted by the person on your left or your right. Because we recognize that right here, right now, at this moment, there's only two people that matter. And that's you and God. And he's been speaking to you today. I don't know if you realize. I know this is not the traditional sermon. This is not traditional service. But God has spoken to us today about what it means to have light in the darkest places, even the morgues of our lives, about having joy no matter what. And maybe today you can relate more with Timothy's friend than Tim. Maybe right now you're at that point where you've turned to all sorts of things. You've t turned to pornography, you've turned to alcohol, you've turned to drugs. Some of you are worshiping your children, you've idolized your kids. And you're beginning to realize that there's no joy in that. Can I tell you something? God never intended for anyone or anything in your life to bring you joy but Him. And if you're asking someone or something to bring you joy, you're asking them to do the impossible. But Tim wants you to meet, and I would love for you to introduce you to the joy giver, the original, the one who created joy by speaking a word. And today, that God that created joy wants to save you, wants to place his light inside of you, wants to, to save you from a heart of depression and discouragement and despair. You're saying, Randy, that sounds too good to be true. It is. That's why we call it grace. That's why we sing songs like Amazing Grace, because it is amazing that God would want to save a wretch like us. But the good news of the gospel is that he does. He wants to save you so bad that he sent his son on that first Easter 2,000 years ago so that he might climb up on a cross and die so that you don't have to go to the woods and put a single shot into your brain. He died so that you don't have to go through life hopeless and alone and joyless. He died so that we might live. That's how much God wants to save you from this discouraging life that you're living. That's how much God wants to save you from this depressing life and existence that you have. You're saying, well, Randy, how do I get that salvation? How do I receive that treasure? How do I receive that joy that has nothing to do with my circumstance but has everything to do with God? Well, the Bible says clearly that our job is to call upon the name of the Lord. It is our job to cry out to Him. And that word call, it literally is, 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 is a picture of somebody who is drowning and they're crying out for a life vest. And maybe today you're drowning in your discouragement. Maybe today you're drowning in your despair. Maybe you're, today you're drowning in your hopelessness. Are you ready to call? Are you ready to cry out to him? Are you ready to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? Now remember, you're calling upon a Lord. You're not calling upon some little person. You're calling upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And to receive the King of kings and the Lord of lords means what? That he doesn't stop being king and he doesn't stop being Lord. That when you ask him to come into your heart and life, he don't change. He changes you. And so are you ready? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you tired of your discouragement, your depression? Are you ready to call upon the name of the Lord? You're saying, Randy, I am. I'm ready. I, I didn't come to church here today to, to receive Jesus, but I realize I need him. But Randy, I just don't know what to say to God. How do you call upon God? How do you call upon the name of the Lord? Well, in just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. It's a prayer very similar that I prayed with my daddy ever so long ago when I realized how hopeless and discouraged I was. And if you'll pray this prayer with me, not to me, but if you'll pray this prayer with me to God, then, then you can be saved, you can be forgiven, you can be given a new heart and a new life. You can receive that joy that's available every morning. You're saying, Randy, do I need to pray it out loud? Well, I want you to. Here's why. 
Because the second you walk out that door, the evil one's going to try to convince you that you didn't do anything, that nothing really happened, that this was all just imagination. But I have found that when we say things out loud, we remember and so this is what we're going to do. We're going to do everything we can to make it as simple for you as possible. We don't want to embarrass you. But there will be people all around you today. They're going to be praying this prayer out loud with me today. Not because necessarily they need it, but they want to join you. They want to encourage you. They want to support you. And so I wonder, I've done all I can to make this as simple and as painless as possible. Are you ready? Are you ready to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, if you are, Pray with me right now. Just pray. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I pray. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me to God, then guess what? You've been saved. You've been given a new heart, a new life. Jesus has come, and he has set himself on the throne of your heart. And he's not going to change, but he is changing you. You say, Randy, what do I need to do now? What's the first thing I need to do? Do I need to get baptized? I saw you did a baptism service not too long ago. You do need to get baptized, but the first thing you need to do is you need to tell somebody. You can tell Timothy when you take his picture with him today. You can tell Jason. You can tell me. You can tell Bruce. You can tell Paul. You can tell, just tell somebody. Make sure you tell somebody the wonderful news that happened to you today. Let me pray for you right now. Dear God, I just thank you for your love. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you're still saving people today. I thank you for the good news of the gospel that, that Lord, we can receive new life. We can get a new heart. And that while we may be lonely, we're never alone from here on out. Lord, I just pray that those who prayed that prayer with me today for the first time, be with them. Give them the excitement, the joy of their salvation, to, to share with somebody, to tell somebody what God did for them. God, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Be with us now. Lord, help us to continue to respond to what you've said to us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.